In the last few weeks, our searchings have been helped, at least I hope they have been helped, by a focus on two searchers in bed, June 16, 1904, Poldy and Molly. And now we're switching to another June 16, June 16, 1833. And the place is a boat in the Mediterranean, and John Henry Newman, that some of you may have heard of, is writing a hymn or a poem that is to become a hymn, uh, Lead Kindly Light. And I'm taking that as a sort of a focus for tonight. Uh, it's a Christian hymn. John Henry Newman was a, an Anglican at the time, at the age of 31. And uh, 30 years later, uh, it was put to music. And some of you perhaps know it, have sung it in churches. And it, while it's Christian, it is to some extent international. Indeed, one of the things about it I, I learned recently was that at a conference of an international religious gathering, uh, they couldn't agree on very much. What can we pray about, sing about at the conference? And eventually they settled a group of Muslims, Jews, Catholics, and so on. They settled on two things they could share, the Our Father and Lead Kindly Light. Now, I, I, I think perhaps if you went back to that conference as the details, you'd find that it was a Chicago conference, mainly male. So we, we'd have trouble with the Our Father, but I think still we might not have trouble with Lead Kindly Light. Uh, it, it's a, a powerful uh, poem, and it brings us into the concrete of the 19th century. Last week I talked about the fact that we're not studying reason according to Kant, Hume. We're studying reason as people actually do it. And uh, Newman was above all a man who reasoned and puzzled. He puzzled for years about his, his allegiance to a type of Christianity. Okay, the, the the first verse, I might as well quote for you, Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark, and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distant scene, one step enough for me. Uh, it's the topic of, the central topic of philosophy of religion. And while tonight I'm not going to talk broadly about the search for enlightenment, you can yourselves think it out insofar as you're familiar with uh, people of that, of say the Taoist, uh, the Indian, Shinto, so on. The search takes all these different forms across the globe. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the topic of faith and beliefs. Okay, as usual, I want to list what we're going to deal with, or what I'm going to attempt to deal with. I see a smile on one face who's familiar with the fact that I sometimes make a magnificent list and we don't get off the first point. Uh, but we'll have to get off the first point. Indeed, we'll have to get down to the fourth point, or there will be a riot in this classroom, because the fourth point is examination. I want to talk about examination, which will be on the 26th. You, you, you all know that now. You can stop worrying or start worrying. Uh, and you, when you fail it, there, there's a makeup essay, okay? So our first topic tonight is four props plus page 41 of wealth. We, we have been coming round that topic on each night, the foundational problem, uh, and postponing it. So let's see, can we get into it a little bit tonight? Only a little bit because we have to continue it uh, after the midterm. And it's the fifth point here, in fact. Point two, five whys. And that's process page 47. And I give you that exercise the last day. How many of you spent the week working on it? <laughs> Out there, yeah? 
OK, as we'll see, this is a very serious puzzle. Point three, that's the central point tonight, faith. What is faith? What is the leap of faith? And that is divided into let's call it basics. And like I did last week, in order to help you to notice what is a further development, let's call the second part of this complexities. Faith and and why not list them, since we're hoping to cover them all? Faith and belief, or beliefs. Faith and institutions. Faith and development. Some may call it moral development. Faith and scriptures, faith and failure, or success, and faith and mystery. OK, and then the fourth point, examination under which there are five points. And, and this is not just uh, an extrinsic element in the course. This is internal to the course. That's why it's a topic. What are we doing? I is the topic of philosophy. What am I doing when I'm doing X? Dancing, teaching, and so on. So what am I doing when I'm doing a, a, an examination? And again, we can divide it into the normal examination, or wh what we're talking about here, normative. What might an examination be that would get something going in me? OK. And the final point gets us back to the top, and indeed gets us back to the beginning, beginning Plato's cave. And 4 squared plus 1 props. Isn't that nice for those of you who hate mathematics? OK. All right. Now, this, this question here, it's the foundational problem that I, I introduced a couple of times. And it's introduced very well by this little diagram that you have on page 41. And we already had the four props. Four propositions, I'll write them down symbolically, but props as well, things to lean on, things that will help you think this out. OK, let's, let's do a little exercise. First of all, the diagram. On page 41, it's something like that. And at this stage, you will recognize or think of, associate these boxes with, yeah, sensation, whatting, and ising. Yeah? Well, good, I saw one nod. OK, so sense, whatting, and ising. And those little bumps there I put down as eyeballs. We're dealing here with a problem that can be called the myth of the eyeballs. And again, we, we dealt with that a few weeks ago, a little bit. And I, I startled some of you, I hope. <laughs> OK. Now, what, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with something that is, is very deep as a problem in human life. It's something that Plato spells out when he has this little myth of the cave. And he describes 
are set up here. Suppose somebody tries to get the people to notice what's going on in the cave. Will he have any success? Mm. Now, again, a problem here that I've brought out a couple of times relating to St. Augustine and Tertullian is that it took St. Augustine about 10 years to get this half sorted out. So don't be in a panic. How many of you can relax with that notion that, gosh, this is a nice puzzle. It's not like the one with the alphabet. This is actually a 10-year job. And I've got to take it quietly. Yeah? Is this a, a weird slant that you, you do a course in philosophy and you get a problem that's going to take you 10 years? Yeah? It's a bit like the Canadian economy. <laughs> okay, and it's a problem that you have to relax over. I was reading about the Zen masters this week and I came across a lovely little anecdote which I'll, I'll share with you. The, the monk came to the Zen master and said, uh, Master, when will I reach enlightenment? And the master said, perhaps in 10 years. Oh, master, but if I try harder, perhaps then in 20 years. Okay, so you have to find out how uptight you are about this, or about education, or about being in the know. Uh, wisdom does not come quickly. I don't think we're told that often enough. That's why I keep stressing this superficial half-credit. Uh, and I have to keep stressing it. I know that from the students in my office that they, they, they push on, this is like six weeks out in a music course, and they're gasping to get into Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto. And I say, well, we'll hold it. Okay, so we're carrying on five weeks out in our superficial half credit. How far have we got? Well, lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Okay, one step enough. Okay, th this diagram is supposed to help you notice what is obvious. Tennessee Williams has this marvelous line, we are all condemned to solitary confinement within our own skins. Okay, that's, that's our reality. And I represent that by this this line and the eyeballs out, I could put on ears and, you know, feet and so on. Uh, okay, so there is an input from the eyeballs. I, the lines are drawn like that in the diagram. And there are inputs from the entire skin surface into what I called the sensitive integration. Okay. Or let's use another word for it. And again, I'm using words in a very precise sense. I'm going to use the word percept for that. Your percept. It's the integration of your sensibility. Older views would talk about a common sense in a technical way. Now, the, the problem we raised already was, where is the percept? You, you remember that at the end of one session? Remember I, I joked about moving my glasses and you all went up and down? Hmm? Yeah? You remember that? Yeah? Are you short-sighted? Yeah? Like me? If you took off your glasses, would I be all fuzzy? Yeah. yeah. You short-sighted as well? Yeah? And so you can make the entire room fuzzy just by taking off your glasses. The entire room disappears. Oh, I mean, that is that bad, eh? <laughs> you should get one of these things like Geordie, eh? <laughs> On Star Trek. Okay, uh, the point I, I was trying to introduce and to make you reflect on is the location of the percept. Obviously, the percept is in your head, isn't it? Yeah? 
I'm talking about a sensitive integration. It's in your head. Are we all, are we all happy about that? Yeah? It's, it's a sensitive integration. And, and we could talk about that endlessly in a mistaken fashion, as they do in, a, say, a lot of British philosophy. Do you and I see the same colors? No. We could go through the test for color blindness. You know those books you get with, with circles and we'd all test differently. Yeah? So uh, no, our percepts are personal. Okay? Our sensitive integrations are, are personal and they're cultural. The percept of an Eskimo is not a white snow. It's multicolored. And also they go on a name, but that's that's a refinement. But the main point is, the percept is inside. Uh, yeah? You're willing to let me have that? Yeah? OK, now our problem is, and it's a real problem of growing up, our problem is that this percept inside has an extroverted quality. You have a percept of me, Yeah. And you imagine <laughs> that that is out here, yeah? In fact, I should really draw it upside down because of the structure of this <laughs> within us. But OK, I've got me facing the wrong way around. Let's say you're looking at me at the moment, OK? Why are you facing around the wrong way too? I hate when professors do that because you can't do that with your notes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So you're you're looking out into the the room where you're sitting at home watching television. Yeah. We won't go into the complications of that. One of my students in another class woke up with a hangover on Sunday morning and he turned on the television and, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> like Shane turning up in my ha hangover. Okay. So you're looking out into the room and uh, say you have spectacles, okay? And what do the spectacles do? They improve your percept. Isn't that fair enough? Yeah? Without the, the spectacles, this gets fuzzy, yeah? The people with spectacles agree with me. And those without spectacles, uh, you can do things to your eyeballs to, to experience fuzziness or disorientation. As I mentioned in the book, uh, page 39, I think, if you move your eyeball, you get the whole room to go up and down, OK? Now you don't, do you? But you get this to change. Is that fair enough? Try crossing your eyes. <laughs> OK. So the glasses improve your percept. But we grow up in our animal fashion with this extroverted, as if this was out here. OK. Now, now, that is not easy to work on. This is very difficult to come to grips with. And we'll get back to Plato's version of this. That the scene, the scene fill, is in your head. OK. Is that a silence of consent <laughs> or despair? It is consent, good, yeah? The scene fill is in your head. How do you get at the real fill? By asking what? You get an understanding. And doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. And you go through a process of correctly understanding your experience. OK? And that's the process that I have called knowing. 
It's a process that goes on inside you, okay? Now, I'm claiming that, and one of the points in the examination I will push is that the examination is not an examination in belief. Okay? I am not asking you to believe me. I'm inviting you to discover something scientifically. That knowing, when you use the word I know, you actually have done that. And, and we're back to the question of nodding. Yes. What do you mean by yes? Well, it points to you having done that. And that's our first prop that we talked about before. Knowing is correctly understanding experience. We haven't said anything about what's the real world, where's the real room, but there's an activity you can discover. Uh, you, you've all experienced that activity, haven't you? Yeah? Yeah? Now, the odd thing is, if you say no, you've done it. Okay, you have to think that one out. The odd thing about this scientific process is you have to use this in order to say it's wrong. L l let's talk it out a little bit. I I'm thinking of the one time in my life I actually got a professor to change his mind. <laughs> it was a, a Danish professor, we used to call him uh, the great, Ber great Bernard, or his name was Bernard, and he was about six foot six. And he was married to an Irish woman, and we had a very friendly dinner one evening. Uh, and uh, eventually Bernard said to me, yeah, we called him the Great Dane, that's right. Uh, and eventually Bernard said to me, Philip, I, I cannot quite agree with your view of knowing. So I said, okay, Bernard. <laughs> well, I didn't. <laughs> but, so I said, well, spell that out. Now, I got him to listen to himself. He was saying, I, I, I think that you no, do not understand knowing. Yeah? He was saying that I, I wasn't correctly understanding something called knowing. And after about two hours discussion, he noticed that he was contradicting his performance. Now, does that make any sense to you? I said to Bernard, Bernard, I think that knowing is correctly understanding. And Bernard said, I do not think so. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that I, I didn't correctly understand whatever I was talking about. He was presupposing that eventually we, we'd have to both correctly understand. Yeah? So this is not a matter of you believing this as a formula. It's very handy for a midterm if you, you know, you've been blank right through the course and suddenly there's the midterm. Well, you pace up and down and memorize these four props. Might even get a pass. Okay. <laughs> so knowing is correctly understanding experience and it goes on inside your head. Now the second prop. <coughs> Knowing gets you at, this is, this is very tricky, and this is, you know, 10 years if you take your time, 20 if you fuss. <laughs> knowing gets you at reality. Well, what does that mean? It, it means that this process within us is a natural process of digesting experience, and it ends up with a yes saying, and you never go outside your skin, and by doing that naturally, this is the type of being we are, that gets you at reality without going outside. Uh, you can't go outside. And the history of, the phil of philosophy is full of people trying to prove that you can somehow get outside and compare this to what's outside. Now, there is reality. Nobody has this problem, what's called the epistemological problem. That reality doesn't exist. 
Uh, Etienne Gilson, the famous uh, Thomist philosopher, said, I have known many Kantian philosophers and idealists in my times in the universities, but they all picked up their salary. Uh, they didn't have a problem about the reality of the paycheck. <laughs> okay, so this procedure gets you at reality, and I'm not going into the, the details of it. The, the word intentional is used in the, the book Wealth of Self. Uh, it's, it doesn't get at reality by having another look. It's simply an activity that is natural to the thing called human, and you end up with a knowing, uh, and uh, you can push on in that knowing to become, in a certain sense, the universe. Uh, and this is a huge problem in, in a century where there is no respect for this search. Yeah? You, you have the idiocy of locomotion. We're going at warp nine where no man, they have changed it now, of course, where no one. Yeah? No, no, th this, this inner dynamism gets you at the universe. It, it's not, in a sense, the, the extraordinariness of the galaxies. Yeah, the 15 billion years uh, and the, the light years of distances. It, it's the extraordinariness of the astronomers. Does that make sense? Yeah? That you, you have at the moment a, a great discussion of certain discoveries uh, uh, about the galaxies. But the wonder is that you, you have a group of people with the universe in their minds. Now, knowing gets you at reality, that's, that's a thesis that you can't get out of. Now, yeah? Getting to reality. <coughs> so, reality is just an objective thing, right? Uh, yeah, reality, there, there is reality, okay? Because if my percept is my individual, personal, and cultural, then if I understand my own subjective experience, yeah. so then how could my subjective experience lead you to a universe? Reality, or would I be getting to a, my own subjective reality? Uh, you, you, your percept includes the talk of others. Remember we talked about Molly and Poldy talking, and you hear the words, and it's not just the talk of our others, it's the writings of others, and it, it's the, the libraries of others, and the music of others, and the sights of others, and the sounds of others. Uh, and your, your percept is a, a colossal accumulation over a lifetime, which you, if you're alive, searching, seek to understand in order to really say, is that the case? Don't slide into a false problem. Identify what you've been doing quite well all along. You, you live through life not with this pseudo-epistemological problem, but with the dynamism that is asking, what the hell is going on? Yeah. And there is no doubt about reality. What we're discussing here is how it works. Uh, th there is a problem in philosophy called the problem of knowledge, which is a, a crazy problem. So, uh, how do you do it? By continually coming back and reflecting, and, and if your percept is a bit skew, you go to a shrink. And if it's clouded, you've got screened memories from childhood and so on. So, uh, spontaneously, we appreciate what to do. I, I've used the word appreciate and, and not know. We don't spontaneously know what to do. There's a spontaneity in us prior to knowledge that, that operates. You're desperate. And the desperation is not, uh, am I getting at the object reality, but can I survive? Yeah? So, but the, the thing is, uh, th you're bringing out yeah, the trickiness of this gets you at reality. Because you may have very skewed percepts. 
uh, you may have a terrible education. I talk about people being educated out of their mind. Yeah? And it's a serious problem. I I'll illustrate it by this big book I have here, The Philosophy of Science. You can have institutions that really disorient you. You can have an entire culture that is dedicated to dehumanizing people. And I won't mention what century. <laughs> so, and then you can get to the state where uh, Lonergan describes metaphysics as necessary when uh, you're bewildered, you're going daft, and you want to know what is the truth? You're back at this, this hymn, Lead Kindly Light, but where's the light? It's like the man looking for the kindly eye in the bank, and he found one, it was a glass eye. <laughs> but but yes, yeah, so this is not easy. But the, the general thesis is that no, there's no problem about reality. Let's draw a big circle or round thing. Okay, there is a reality in which each of us is, and we can't get at it by soaking it up through our skin. How do we get at reality? By the intake of sensibility, including uh, readings, talkings, yeah, monuments, and understanding it as best we can. Now, how much of reality do we get at? Very little. <laughs> at the beginning of this century, in 1903, there was great optimism. That's why I like 1904. It's a, it's a funny year. It's not just James Joyce and, Polly and uh, Mo Molly and Polly in bed. It, it, it's, it's the breakdown of human arrogance. Uh, we didn't get into these, well, the Boer War we have back at that period, but. Uh, it's prior to the First World War, but uh, it's certainly the breakdown of optimism in physics. Th there was a notion in physics that, well, a few more decimal places, we're there. We've got the proton, the electron, we've got the elements settled. And then in 1904, it just collapses. And now in physics, you've up to 100 particles and no theory. What, what are physical realities? Uh, and it's, that's the state we're in. So wh what is the reality of the most elementary things, mesons, protons, neutrinos? Is it? <laughs> yeah. So, so this is a very tricky arrow. It gets you at reality. Are, are we near? Well, no. There's, there's a notion that man has come of age. We're not down out of the trees yet. Yeah. And a lot of us are swinging through the low branches of academe, <laughs> the groves of academe. <laughs> okay, and you need a sense of humor. <laughs> okay, so knowledge gets you at reality, uh, not by going outside. Now, the other two props or propositions that we already had, and I know they've been keeping you awake. Okay. One of my students told me she was working on this once, and so I, I'm advising you not to do this. Driving across the bridge to Dartmouth. Don't, don't try and work this stuff as you're driving along. Eh? You're sort of, this isn't the real road. <laughs> Better to do this walking or sitting down. OK, the sensitive integration. I have called it the percept. And the final kicker is the percept is no way like reality. Now, we're going to nurse that and come back to it after the break in the context of Plato's cave. But these, these are four propositions, proposals, that you actually operate with and never noticed, perhaps. You operate this way. You assume you're doing that. Yeah? If somebody is freaking out, you, you're inclined to say, 
wise up. Yeah? Get your act together. You're way off. Hmm? Isn't that true? You're asking them to do this. Get real. <laughs> the sensitive integration is the percept. That's what we talked about here. It, it's, it's inside your head. It's the product of the various types of sensibility, including kinesthetic sensibility that is within. Digestive con well, no, not digestive consciousness, indigestive consciousness. <laughs> Digestion becomes conscious when it's in digestion. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Non-headaches, you know, they're, <laughs> they're okay. It's the headaches that are the trouble. Okay, there, there are four props. And we have worked on this. And this is what we were pushing on, pushing towards with the puzzles. Yeah? You want to know the answer? This has to happen, and you have to be right on. Now, I I'm going to come back to your question here, because being right on can be very personal. And I I'm not going to illustrate it with a large problem, but with, with one of our puzzles. And it's going to be important, the personal solution, when we get to the question of beliefs. Yeah? What are your beliefs? Uh, my, my wife uh, was criticized for a sermon she produced last week in AST because she used beliefs in the plural. The, the critical professor said, well, Christianity, we, we have belief. Yeah? This sort of deposit of faith. Yeah? Yeah? The sacred dung of a dead cow or whatever it is. Yeah? Uh, what, what are our beliefs? Well, they can be very, uh, our personal inner, inner answer can be quite different from the next guy's, and you're using the same word. Think of the, the basic creed, I believe in God. Ask everyone in the congregation, what do you mean? You'll find some of them are talking about their grandmother, who was nice and kindly. Some are talking about their grandfather, who was an old bugger, so on. Uh, belief is a very tricky thing. Now, we can't get into that personal struggle, but I, I want to illustrate it by going back to our puzzles. Uh, one person out of the class solved my crossword puzzle. It was marvelous. Yeah? Congratulations, Anne. <laughs> but the solution isn't the same as mine, okay? So let's take this as an illustration of, of this process. There's an experience. What is the experience that I presented? It's a little box divided in four. OK, it's the cross in the puzzle. Yeah? And the rest of the experience is round, the end of a season. OK? Now, I, I'm bringing out what these exercises were about. You can find other exercises, much bigger exercises. This is a very simple experience, isn't it? it? It's a certain amount of chalk on the blackboard. One of it is a diagram, and the rest of it is recognizable English. OK? Be worse if I tried it in Gaelic or Sanskrit. OK, so you have an experience. Where is the experience? in your head? Yeah. You, you don't seriously think that this is the real blackboard, do you? <laughs> OK, so you see something, and some of you wake up. I'd be tremendously optimistic if I thought everyone was alert and driving. Yeah? Uh, the quotation from St. Thomas on page 13 of Wealth it's from the first part of the Summa Question 84, Article 7. Thomas talks about discovering this insofar as you are struggling to understand. And you have to find out, well, maybe that struggle isn't part of us, part of our culture. A student last night who was working on one of the puzzles remarked, gosh, 
We should be like this all the time. Yeah. Struggling to understand. You can think of, say, the, the minister's meeting with the problem of the economy during the week. Was there really a struggle to understand before they came up with the bright idea of public works and sewers or whatever? Hmm? Keep something flowing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, being human means that, yeah, this happens. There's, there's a drive, there's a lift. What is it? And uh, unlike deeper problems like the economy or, or one's psyche, well, this isn't so tough. Uh, how many of you know the answer to this? Yeah? Oh, I love this. <laughs> and the rest of the puzzle is, is worse. Okay, round the end of a season, Okay, the solution of the puzzle that this other lady came up with, I'll help you to see it. Round the end of the season, round, you can think of, say, a clock face, it's round. Uh, the end of a season. Uh, time, yeah? Springtime, doesn't that sound good, yeah? Uh, it's not bad, yeah? So, time. And, and the clincher is that it fits with the, the clue down, yeah? That's if you're doing the standard crossword. You can, of course, cheat on these, and then any overlapping square, you divide it in two. See, so you have I for that one, and say O for the other one. <laughs> but the normal expectation is that the one letter does. OK. Now, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that, yeah, that's a solution. Yeah, you can have a solution, and it's not the next person's solution. Yeah? But it, it's right on for you. And this will be very important when we get to the question of, of beliefs. <coughs> OK, now, let's see, can I help you to get my <laughs> solution? Which is a lot meaner and trickier. And again, what am I doing? I'm doing revision for the examination. I'm trying to get you to notice this. How do I get from here to here? No, how do I get you from here to here? It's the basis of a philosophy of education. Aristotle says you juggle. You juggle with the diagram. You change it round. Aristotle is a marvelous illustration of the angles in a triangle being three right angles. How do you show that the, the three angles add up to 180 to a straight angle. If you look at the old Euclid book, you'll find that the proof adds a line here and so on. Aristotle says, well, draw, draw enough lines to make it stare the people in the face. And many of you know that triangle has three right angles, or two right angles, yeah? Aristotle says, well, okay, draw a line through the top. And some of the brighter people say, yeah. And then you have the other people. <laughs> and for them, you, you, you make a mark here and here. And then you make a mark here and here. Huh? And some of them say, wow. And then uh, there are the others. <laughs> and for the others, you make a mark here. And then you get colored chalk, and you swear, and you curse, and you draw lines like that. You know? <laughs> But it can't be done hastily. And then the insight occurs. Yeah? And you say, is this really it? Yeah. Yeah. Similarly here, you muck around. There isn't any other way. And an educational system that doesn't take time to muck around is a farce. Yeah? OK, so let's muck around with it. I really love this. You, you have to think of the seasons. Yeah, well, that's not too hard, is it? Four seasons. How, what do you call them in Canada? I'm never sure. Fall. Is it autumn or fall, you call it? Yeah. Somebody told me you've only two seasons in Nova Scotia. Three. Uh, July, <laughs> August, and winter. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. OK, so take the four regular seasons, spring, summer, autumn, autumn and winter. Yeah? Now, what I have to do is, is try and suggest 
aspects of this that will make the answer spring to mind. Ring a bell. <laughs> ah, <laughs> something's happening, yeah? Round, round, round. Ring a bell, does it ring a bell? Ding dong. <laughs> the end of a season, spring. Yeah? Anything happening? That's the end of a season, isn't it? You got it, yeah? Wow, okay, yeah? All right. Yeah, that leave you happy? Does it fit? Yeah, that's what solving a puzzle, you fit things together, whether it's the economy or, or th these two bits, yeah? And you've got it, correctly un understanding experience. And you didn't memorize it. And it took a little time. And it's fun. <coughs> okay. So that, that's what the puzzle's aimed at getting you to do. And I don't think that this part can make much sense after five weeks. The thing to do then is to fail this course and repeat it next year. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to leave those props for the moment. My heavens, I certainly must. And get into this question of the five whys. It's the same topic. Now some of you have tackled it, page 47 of process. The, the problem I gave you, again, we're still puzzling. Our problem was you go home tonight, you go back up to your room in Assisi or whatever, and you find on your door, there's no significance in this, it's merely a particular type of curve. It was very important in astronomy for Ptolemy. It's called an epicycle. Okay, you find that on your door. And in the book, you find this little diagram. Okay, but that's an optimistic diagram. It's supposing that you're still human as you move into adulthood. And that, <laughs> that's a lot to expect, eh? <laughs> Why? Now, what we want to try and do is discover the meanings of why. If you don't like this, you can take a simpler problem. The bridge, the bridge to Dartmouth, or a cartwheel. Okay. Why is a cartwheel round? Now, is anyone going to help me out here? I won't go as slow as I normally do. It normally takes at least an hour to get the class to find these. And that's not bad. As I mentioned the last day, it took Aristotle an awful long time to find these and write them up in his metaphysics. The meanings of why. A a any suggestions? Yeah. Well, why is a cartoon round? Yeah. The obvious answers. Come on, risk it. Don't be shy. Any light or darkness? Why is a cartwheel round? Gosh, there's got to be some. I don't want to give the answers away. Yeah? I think I, I let you think about that, and you're going to come back after the break with the answer. I, I'll move on to the next topic, yeah? Why is a cartwheel round? Obviously, you haven't been doing your homework since. It's a good job we had a two weeks break. What would it be like if there was no break, yeah? There must be some suggestion. Spontaneous answer. Well, why is a, cart why is a bicycle wheel round? 
Come on, don't be shy. Well, it rolls. If it was a different shape, it might not roll. Yes, yes. if it was, it was a different it. shape, it might not roll. Okay, so you're talking about the shape, and you're talking about the purpose, aren't you? Yeah. So why is the cartwheel round? Okay, the question of purpose comes up, doesn't it? Yeah, and it comes up with this. Why would anyone do that? Wouldn't yeah? Spontaneously. And yeah, what, what else comes up spontaneously with this? Come on, you, you, you would spontaneously stop and say, what would you say? What? What is it? <laughs> you, you might, yeah, what is it? Okay, yeah, it might come up. What is it? And you're on to the question of what makes it the shape, okay? Okay, you're looking for, we've got a couple more answers now. You're looking for the shape or the why of the shape, what, what Plato called the form, why is a cartwheel round? Yeah? Because it has the form of circularity, because the spokes are all the same length. Yeah? But that's not good enough because the spokes could all be the same length and it would be like that. Yeah? But if you push it, yeah, that's an answer to a why question. Okay, uh, and you have a purpose, but I think there's a more spontaneous question. Yeah, you come up to your door. Yeah, or make it bigger. You, you come up to your house and it's burnt down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who? Well, you, yeah, who? <laughs> who the hell did that? Well, yeah, how? Uh, and how? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. For what purpose? Yeah. Why is that there? Because somebody did it. <laughs> Isn't that pretty spontaneous? Yeah. Who done it? Why is it there? Somebody put it there. Yeah. Some efficient person, some busybody did it. Somebody did it. For some unknown reason. They put this shape. Yeah. How are we doing? Now, you, you still got the problem of the cartwheel. Uh, think of the bridge. We, we might get these done before the, the break, yeah? You got the bridge over Dartmouth, yeah? The sort of suspended structure. Uh, and this has a definite shape. It's a very complex geometrical problem to specify the geometry of a bridge. OK, now, why has the bridge got that shape? Yeah? There's a why here. Yeah, it works, OK, so that's the purpose, yeah, because it works, yeah? But really, now, wh why? And, and this is terribly obvious. Why? why has the bridge got that shape? Why has this building got this shape? Okay, somebody built it. Okay, somebody built it. Okay, that way. Now, okay, but why did they build it? Build it that way. Come on, you're you're on to it. Because the plan said to build it that way. Yeah, isn't it obvious? It's one of the whys. Yeah, there was a design. Okay, the plan. This is marvelous, and, and there's one missing. <laughs> Why is the cartwheel round? Why is the bridge like that? Somebody built it that way. There's a purpose getting across from Halifax to Dartmouth. There's a design. The design is going to be the form of the bridge. And you need workmen to build the bridge. But you need something else, don't you? Yeah. We've got it, by Jove, she's got it. Yeah. Okay, you have material. Yeah? Isn't that fair enough? 
Isn't it obvious? Huh? So, after the event, yeah, you need material. <laughs> you need that. Uh, now you need 75 cents, do you? Unless you're walking. <laughs> okay, you need material. And these are a specification of our spontaneous attitude. Yeah? Why, when you tease out its meaning, you find, yeah, it, it means purpose, it means design, it means who done it, what is the form, why are you looking so sad? Yeah? That in, in Ireland we would say, what's, how's the form? I know you don't say that in Canada, but it, it's a phrase we use. Well, how's the form? What shape are you in? It's a why question. Why are you looking so gloomy? Form. And it's very hard to get that. So we've got what can be called five causes. And you find that they correspond. Anyone help me out here? Is it obvious? There is sense. There is a what question. There is an is question. There is a what to do question. An am I to do question. And, and, and that was specifying us. Yeah? This is me. I have these levels in me. And in that order. And you find that yeah, in the history of reflection on this, there emerged five causes, five B causes. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about that before we get into the question of faith. Five causes. Technically, the final cause, the exemplary cause, the efficient cause, the formal cause, and the material cause. And they relate to our five levels. Any puzzle about that suggestion? You all remember vaguely the five levels? <laughs> yeah? Okay. And what we will find, and again, we will not develop this, or maybe we will a little bit. We've lost one class, so I'm not sure. We will find that these five causes are related to the very famous five ways of Thomas Aquinas, if you line up the famous five ways backwards, final cause, exemplary cause, efficient cause, formal cause, and material cause. Okay, but th the problem is all the time discovering one's own dynamic, yeah? This orientation. And the big question is, the maybe I keep introducing to the class. The, the spontaneous person who is still alive, yeah? But there are those in our zombie world who just open the door and go in. That's it. Okay? <laughs>